Nuke Radio. This is episode 22. Today is Thursday, April the 12th. With me today is Jules and Kurt from IrritateTheState.net, who's going to run some clips for us. If there was any doubt in your mind about the safety of nuke plants and earthquakes, this is the show for you. We're going to run down the list of earthquakes over the last 24 hours, and we're going to play some clips from an Al Jazeera documentary that was removed from YouTube about two months ago that we have a copy of. Um, yesterday started out with two very large earthquakes in the West Pacific, uh, 8.0s, and then Global Incident Map actually had seven of them, seven 8.0s, and there's been a barrage of earthquakes in that area since. Something that was rather unusual about these earthquakes is that it's, well, let me just read from you what the U.S. Geological Survey is saying about it. As one of the world's most seismically active places, Indonesia is located on the Pacific Ring of Fire, an arc of volcanoes and fault lines encircling the Pacific Basin. Pressure builds up in the rocks over time and is eventually released in an earthquake. Wednesday's quake was followed by a magnitude 8.2 aftershock. Both were a strike-slip earthquake of this size. This is very, very large, said Kevin Furlong, a professor of geosciences at Penn State. So large, in fact, that the main shock went into the history books. Record-keeping by the USGS National Earthquake Information Center ranks Wednesday Shaker as the 11th largest since 1900. It's in an area where there could be some faults that are intersecting with each other. And that seemed to start off a cascading event around the globe, which has ended up right here in the U.S. There was a 6.0 also in Japan that was wiped off the map. And right before we went on air, another 5.6 near Fukushima. But there was a 4.5 in the North Atlantic, right off the coast of Maine. There was a 5.9 in Oregon, a 7.0 in southern Mexico. Overnight, there was a 4.3 in Utah. And there were a couple of quakes, too, that disappeared off the maps yesterday. And I saw this one and actually sent it around to a few people that saw it, too. There was a 5.1 in Hudson Bay, Ontario. Now, a few days prior to this, there was a 2.6 in Minnesota, a 2.5 in the UP of Michigan. These are really unusual places to be having these kinds of earthquakes. And then this morning, we had a 4.9 on the South Atlantic Ridge, a 2.1 in Arkansas, and a 3.1 in Oklahoma. Jules, you said you were in an earthquake in New York? Yeah, I've actually been in a few of them, but I think... Um I mean, obviously, the one from this past summer that hit Virginia, we felt here. But uh, one that originated nearby was back in um, 2001. We had a pretty sizable one here up in New York that uh, woke us up at like 5 in the morning with things slamming against the walls. But, yeah, they're, they're not unheard of in New York, but we just don't get them often. I mean, I think I felt three in my entire lifetime. I felt one. I, I, it happened... During the night while I was sleeping when I was a kid and I woke up and the bed had moved across the room <laughs> and I wow. didn't even wake up. <laughs> um, but there were a couple other events, too, that uh, may or may not have anything to do with these earthquakes. Dutch Sense on YouTube uh, recorded some booms in St. Louis yesterday and a rumbling that went on for about 20 minutes. Uh, I've seen a couple people posting today that they heard rumbling yesterday in southwest Ohio. There's been a couple of rock slides in an area that uh, Jules and I are both familiar with, the Niagara Escarpment. It's a huge outcropping of rock that runs from Niagara Falls, and it kind of curves up around Michigan. It goes through Georgian Bay um, along the, the top of Lake Superior and then down into Wisconsin, and it just so happens to end near Clintonville, where they had the booms before. And I saw this guy had posted about this on a, on a forum, and I searched for the article, and I actually found it in Canadian News in Hamilton. Another 403 rock slide prompts concerns. There's been another rock slide along the 403 in Hamilton. Some boulders rolled up against a fence next to the downbound lanes on the Ancaster Hill yesterday afternoon. City officials are asking the Ministry of Transportation to respond. Last Tuesday, a fence along the same stretch of highway prevented a boulder the size of a semi-truck from crashing into the downbound lanes. Now, this is supposed to be a very, very stable 
rock formation, but it does have an underlying bed of shale. The rock that is on top of it is called dolomite, and it's like a type of limestone. And if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, that's actually what the falls are pouring over, is that cliff. That is part of the Niagara Escarpment. It, it winds all the way around above Michigan and down into Wisconsin. So it's been having rock slides. Also, may or may not be related, and this was just sent to me right before we went on air, in regards to the Sea of Cortez or Baja, where they had the 6.9, 6.2, and then later a 4.4, 4.7, and a 4.2 overnight. There was a stretch of sand and beach that disappeared at Los Frailes, Baja. Sunday morning, March 26, the beach in Los Frailes disappeared. Lost forever were 200 meters of beachfront by 100 meters deep. The angler that emailed the photo said that the beach disappeared very quickly and is now a steep bank that appears to still be slowly eroding. Then there was a second event on April 1st in Los Cabos. Today at 5 a.m., some kind of explosion occurred and was gone a stretch of beach. This was being translated from a Mexican TV show in Cabo Puma, Los Frailes, Baja, California, Sur. With the arrival of the Easter holidays and under many families often camping on the beach for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of Holy Days, the delegate warns vacationers prepare to arrive to the area if they do not camp out near the beach area and then disappears millions of tons of sand and it is unknown what happened. And they've sent divers into that area and it looks almost like some kind of fault opened up underground and the beach just disappeared. Yeah, Christina, I don't know if you remember um, after the New Zealand, the big New Zealand quake, um, there were some videos of that happening along the beachfront there, too. Like the entire beach, people were standing on the beach filming. The entire beach was getting engulfed, and they're backing up as they're filming, and the beach is just falling, blunk, 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 into the water, getting sucked into something. That's really crazy. And now we've got problems with the, possibly the BP well again. CNN Money is reporting this morning a huge drop in BP shares after news came out that the oil spill may have been reactivated. There's a slick that's a mile wide and 10 to 12 miles long that's appearing. So I don't know what's going on there. But <clears throat> looking in that part of the country with this Niagara escarpment and where some of the earthquakes and booming sounds have been, over the last few days, if you draw a line, well, it would look like a question mark that would go over the top of Michigan. That's the escarpment. It would come down through the Poconos where we have had boom events all the way down to the BP well. And what lays right in the middle of there is the New Madrid. Oh, that's so, lovely. <laughs> I didn't realize that. In the, in the last two months, the NRC has reported 96 reactors in the U.S. are in earthquake zones that have higher risks than were previously thought. 27 of those plants have a greater risk than what the plant was built to withstand. And unfortunately, I don't have the list of what those 27 plants are. I know that two of them are going to be talked about in the clip that we're going to play, um, Diablo Canyon, which is a sore spot for a lot of activists in the California area. It's not only is it located near a fault, a new fault was discovered just offshore of there, and just a little bit south along the coast, there's evidence that in the past, a huge tsunami had hit there that was anywhere from 100 to 150 feet high. So we'll play that clip when we come back. You're listening to Nuked Radio. On March 10, 2011, the highest-ranking members of the NRC, or Nuclear Regulatory Commission, gathered in Washington to make an important decision. Okay, would Commissioner Ossendorf please affirm your votes? Aye. That's all. In a unanimous vote, the NRC approves a 20-year license extension for the controversial Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. Just hours later in Japan, a plant with the exact same nuclear reactor design will face a catastrophic event. A devastating earthquake, followed by a tsunami with waves twice as high as the seawall around the plant, floods out the emergency generators. President Obama warns Americans in Japan to evacuate the danger zone. ...for an evacuation of American citizens who are within 50 miles of the plant. 
Without emergency power, engineers can't keep the reactors cool. Gas explosions destroy units 1, 2, 3, and 4. Radiation levels at the plant are so high that it will take months to get the situation under control. Back in Washington, the chairman of the NRC, Gregory Yatsko, put the agency on high alert. First and foremost, when there was the earthquake, uh, the agency activated its emergency response uh, center. We were concerned about the potential for a tsunami to hit the plants on the west coast of the United States. Yetsko also ordered an immediate safety review of all U.S. plants. Here in the United States, we have an obligation to the American people to undertake a systematic and methodical review of the safety of our own domestic nuclear facilities. There are 104 nuclear plants in the United States, originally licensed to operate for 40 years. Now, many are reaching the end of their approved lifespan, and the companies that operate them are looking to the NRC to relicense them for another 20 years. Our reporting has uncovered serious problems with NRC oversight that could be putting over 100 million Americans who live near nuclear plants at risk. This siren tests the emergency alert system in the town surrounding the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. A series of dramatic equipment failures at the plant have put Vermonters on edge. The most dramatic of which was the collapse of a cooling tower in 2007. Spewing cooling water all over the backyard. It wasn't radioactive, but that wasn't the point. The point was it's a component of a nuclear power plant that was allowed to degrade to the degree where it actually fell down. And that one picture went viral around this state. And almost overnight, the support that this company had received since the day they bought the plant in 2002 evaporated. Bob Stannard, a former state legislator, says he was once pro-nuke, but changed his mind after seeing these photos. He's now a lobbyist for a local advocacy group. A corporation that would allow this to happen to a plant when they're under the microscope and the white hot light of review, not only from the NRC, but from the state of Vermont. I went to my wife and said, I've got to go back to lobbying. I owe it to my grandchildren who weren't born at that time to do what I can to close this plant down. This picture, we believe, was taken by an employee of Vermont Yankee and was smuggled out to a uh, nuclear safety advocate who released it to the public. Bob Audette, a longtime reporter with the Brattleboro Reformer, says the company that runs the power plant, Entergy, initially hid the extent of the damage from the public, raising questions about their operating procedures. They're doing a cost-benefit analysis. So they're saying, how far can we push this machine? How, how far can we push this pipe before we replace it, this steam valve, this turbine? How long can the steam dryer last? Um, should we replace it ahead of time, or can we push it even farther just to save money? And the cooling tower collapse wasn't the only serious equipment failure, according to Vermont's Attorney General, William Sorrell. In 2004, poor maintenance on one of the plant's electrical systems caused a serious fire in the turbine building, forcing the plant into emergency shutdown. Then, in 2009, in a series of state hearings on the condition of the plant, Vermont officials asked Entergy if underground pipes at the plant could be leaking radioactively contaminated water. Time after time, Entergy executives testified that they had no underground pipes. They were on record repeatedly as denying the existence of underground pipes carrying radioactive materials. But in January of 2010, water contaminated with radioactive tritium was found leaking from these underground pipes. Entergy backtracked telling Vermont's attorney general that while they didn't have underground pipes, they did have a network of buried pipes. Sorry, we've said this to you in the past, uh, including under oath, but uh, that was incorrect information, uh, misleading information, and uh, uh, sorry. Attorney General Sorrell opened up a 17-month investigation. In a deposition videotaped for a later lawsuit, Former Executive Vice President Curtis A. Bear admitted that the company misled state officials. Um, testimony that was given um, pursuant to um, underground and below surface um, pipes that could have been more accurate. 
just a general management breakdown is how I would describe it. Shame on a multi-billion dollar a year corporation if they cannot articulate clearly. And if they can't, that doesn't mean that you give them a pass and say, oh, mistake on your part. I mean, <laughs> you want absolute credibility and clarity from those that operate nuclear power plants. Vermont Yankee had to remove and treat more than 300,000 gallons of radioactively contaminated water. By now, the state's governor, attorney general, and legislature joined the groundswell against relicensing. If its board of directors and its <clears throat> management were thoroughly infiltrated by anti-nuclear activists, I do not believe they have, could have done a better job <laughs> in destroying their own case. But under U.S. law, only the NRC can decide if a plant is safe. And on the eve of the Fukushima disaster, the NRC approved Vermont Yankee's 20-year license extension. Well, people don't trust the NRC. They think it's the lapdog of the industry, that basically it's there to affirm everything the industry does. And it's too cozy with the industry. It wasn't supposed to be like this. The NRC initially developed an extensive inspection regimen to ensure that aging plants were safe to operate an additional 20 years. But those inspections went awry with the very first nuclear plant that came up for relicensing, Yankee Row in Massachusetts. Over the 30 years of its operation, the reactor vessel has become so embrittled that the vessel is in danger of rupturing. This would most likely result in a large release of radiation to the environment. The NRC's inspections found that the plant's reactor vessel was in need of immediate replacement. Unwilling to spend the money, the company decided to shut the plant down, even before its original license had expired. That was an eye-opener for the nuclear industry. You seek a 20-year extension to your facility, and you end up having to shut down eight years early. David Lockbaum, a nuclear engineer with the Union of Concerned Scientists, says that when the next plant came up for relicensing, the industry successfully lobbied to narrow the requirements. In 1995, the NRC revised its license renewal process to narrow the focus. That was the lesson learned from Yankee Row. We'll just stop looking. And because we're not looking, we cannot find any more of those problems. The NRC's revised regulations for relicensing would now focus only on the aging management plans provided by the utility itself. It's striking what the NRC does not review no thorough inspections of the infrastructure. Somewhere beyond the sea, somewhere waiting for me, my lover stands on golden sands and watches. of new earthquake hazards and no reevaluation of emergency plans. We never look, so therefore we never catch those shortcomings and fix them. Since then, 71 nuclear plants have applied for relicensing and every single one has been approved. NRC Chairman Gregory Yatsko insists that the streamlined standards don't put the public at risk. Our job is to make sure that plants are safe today. Uh, tomorrow and, and every day that they have a license to operate. So if there's a problem with a particular facility, um, it's our job to make sure they address that, that, that problem now, not wait until license renewal. But NRC inspectors who are stationed in plants are only able to examine about 5 to 10 percent of plant systems each year. And several close calls have raised questions as to the adequacy of this oversight. At the Byron plant in Illinois, a critical pipe which cools the plant was allowed to corrode to such a degree that it created an emergency. They started to peel away the rust off the pipe and the pipe just burst. It just it was done. You know, the only thing holding that together was the rust. And so it burst as a result of the loss of the water that forced the shutdown of a nuclear power plant. That doesn't happen every day. George Mully, a 26-year veteran of the NRC Inspector General's office, investigated the Byron emergency. He says... Corrosion like this doesn't happen overnight. 
Month after month, plant engineers lowered the acceptable thickness of the pipe, eventually claiming that a paper-thin pipe would be safe to operate. 0.03. Now, 0.03 is three hundredths of an inch. I don't know how, actually, you, I don't know how you can get a pipe wall that thin. It's like seven or eight sheets of paper. I mean, you are talking paper thin. And this is carrying water under pressure, used to cool a power plant. According to Mully, the NRC should have caught the problem much earlier. Just today, I checked the NRC event notifications before we uh, came on air. <clears throat> and now this is without earthquake activity. At Fermi 2 in Michigan, there was a pump trip which prevented fuel from being cooled for 11 minutes. It only takes 15 minutes for things to start melting down. In Grand Gulf, Mississippi, there was a fire in the main condenser, which took 37 minutes to extinguish. They had to call in outside help from the fire department. And in Limerick, Pennsylvania, several thousand gallons of radioactive water overflowed through the cooling tower, forming puddles all over the plant site. It was tested and found to have increased tritium. And, of course, they said there's no risk to the public. All local and emergency agencies have been notified. This needs to go on the local news there. This is just happening, and what was being discussed in this clip, this is all happening without earthquakes. This is just normal wear and tear. When you have rusty pipes and you have old parts and you have plants that are nearing or past 40 years of age, there's 10,000 parts in these reactors. There's just a multitude of things that can go wrong. And the more complicated a system is, the harder it is to determine how all these things are going to interact with each other. And we have another clip that's going to address the earthquake situation. It's about six California, minutes. one of the most seismically active zones in the world. Many think it's only a matter of time until the big one. This may be the facility that if something does go wrong, it could be our Fukushima, not because of a tsunami but because of a massive earthquake that could cause catastrophic damage. State Senator Sam Blakesley represents the district that includes the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, considered the most seismically dangerous in the country. Now, if we're talking about something over a magnitude seven. Blakesley knows the devastating power of earthquakes better than most. He has a PhD in earthquake studies, and he's been urging the NRC to take seismic threats more seriously. In 2008, he became even more alarmed when a seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey discovered a new earthquake fault. Looking offshore, I found a number of small earthquakes that previously had looked kind of scattered actually lined up along a line that ran basically right along the coastline near the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. Jean Hardebeck's research points to a dangerous possibility. She says that the newly discovered shoreline fault could combine with another fault called the Hosgri to create a powerful earthquake right at the plant. A similar scenario surprised Japanese seismologists at Fukushima. But the owners of Diablo Canyon, Pacific Gas and Electric, say there's nothing to worry about. They say Hardebeck's analysis is flawed and the plant can operate safely for years. Having now completed a very rigorous and thorough feasibility study I'm both pleased and excited to announce we are officially beginning the process to seek license renewal for the Diablo Canyon facility. I could not understand why the utility is racing to relicense before the seismic information came forward. It was almost as though they were afraid of what they would find. In the wake of the Japanese disaster, Blakesley called for hearings and confronted an NRC official. And we're now in a situation where we have information about a shoreline fault, a new fault in my district next to my constituents. And you're telling me you're just going to continue business as usual and not delay to get the information before you do your site safety review. And that's unacceptable. The shoreline fault is well below the ground acceleration that the plan is designed to. How do you know that? based on the scientific studies that have been performed today. By and, whom? Uh, there was a number of folks that were involved with that. PG&E was a party to that. We expect licensees to do those studies. But relying on information from licensees to determine if a plant is safe may put the public at risk.
These PG&E documents, obtained by the Center for Investigative Reporting, reveal that despite their public claims of safety, PG&E's own seismologists have considered the implications of a magnitude 7.2 earthquake along the shoreline fault. This graph shows the ensuing shaking could exceed what the plant is designed to withstand. The problem is with the magnitude 7.2, you're getting perilously close to the limits of the facility. But in its in formal report to the NRC, PG&E sent another graph, this one showing no seismic concerns. They told the NRC that because the shoreline fault is segmented, it can't rupture with nearby faults, and therefore a larger earthquake at the plant is impossible. Hardebeck says that way of thinking doesn't add up. The data I'm looking at, it actually doesn't make sense to the earthquakes along the shoreline fault and very clearly go all the way to the Hosgrave fault. PG&E declined our request for an interview, but in a written statement said, Diablo Canyon was designed and constructed with seismic safety in mind, and components of the facility were tested to withstand probable ground motions resulting from nearby faults. We should be asking the question, why isn't that work being done by other seismic organizations which have no direct financial interest or benefit in how or when that data is viewed, reviewed, and interpreted. One of the reasons there isn't that kind of rigorous third-party independent oversight is because the NRC doesn't ask it, doesn't demand it, doesn't seek it. PG&E isn't the only company that has an incentive to minimize earthquake risks. While the industry claims that all its plants are seismically safe, the NRC has recently acknowledged that at least 27 reactors in the U.S. have a known earthquake hazard that is greater than the plant is designed to withstand. Did you know that the Indian Point Energy Center helps power everything you see here and here and here? You might be surprised to know that the plant that tops the list is Indian Point, just outside New York City. Indian Point provides about a quarter of the electricity to New York City and Westchester. The plant's owner, Entergy, has turned to former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani as a paid spokesman because Indian Point has some powerful opponents in New York. My position has been for a long time that the plant is risky and the plant should not operate. Governor Cuomo vigorously opposes Indian Point's relicensing. His administration has sued the NRC, alleging the agency is not enforcing its own safety regulations. There is a growing recognition, not just among crazies who wear headbands and play bongs, but a, a large body of conventional people like elected officials and states who are beginning to get nervous about the adequacy of nuclear power to be run safely in this country. Not whether it could be, but whether it will be. At the end of that clip, they were saying people were getting nervous. And, and speaking of getting nervous, um, in the last few minutes, another earthquake was posted on global incident maps, a 3-8. That's just above the one that was posted last night off the coast of Maine. And we were talking about Indian Point. It's a 38-year-old plant, and I want to read you the list of incidents. And these have nothing to do with seismic activity. This is just normal these are just normal operating conditions that these uh, circumstances occurred in. In 1973, five months after Indian Point 2 opened, the plant was shut down when engineers discovered buckling in the steel liner of the concrete dome in which the nuclear reactor is housed. On October 17, 1980, 100,000 gallons of Hudson River water leaked into the Indian Point 2 containment building from the fan cooling unit undetected by a safety device designed to detect hot water. The flooding covered the first nine feet of the reactor vessel and was discovered when technicians entered the building. Two pumps, which should have removed the water, were found to be inoper inoperative. There was intense scrutiny of the Indian Point plant between 93 and 97 when it was on the federal list of the nation's worst nuclear plants. In February of 2000, the most serious incident at the plant occurred when a small radioactive leak from a steam tube forced the plant to close for 11 months. Probably because that guy said, what, about those tubes are about as thick as seven pieces of paper. 
In 2001, a series of leaks sprung up in non-nuclear parts of the plant. In 2005, Entergy workers, while digging, discovered a leak in a spent fuel pool. Water containing tritium and strontium-90 was leaking through a crack in the pool building and then finding its way into the nearby Hudson River. Workers were able to keep the fuel rods safely covered despite the leak. In 2007, a transformer at Unit 3 caught fire and the NRC raised its level of inspections because the plant had experienced many unplanned shutdowns. Now, this plant is just a little bit north of New York City. On April 23, 2007, the NRC fined the owner of the Indian Point Nuclear Plant $130,000 for failing to meet a deadline for a new emergency siren plan. The 150 sirens at the plant are meant to alert residents within 10 miles to a plant emergency. And if you follow the forecast at all, you know that those sirens are often inoperable. On January 7, 2010, NRC inspectors re- reported that an estimated 600,000 gallons of mildly radioactive steam was intentionally vented to the atmosphere after an automatic shutdown of Unit 2. After the vent, one of the vent valves stayed open for two days. It seemed there was a minor steam generator tube leak from the primary circuit. The levels of tritium in the steam were below those allowed by NRC safety standards. On November 7th of 2010, an explosion occurred in the main transformer for Indian Point 2, spilling oil into the Hudson River. The owner of the Indian Point nuclear plant later agreed to pay a $1.2 million penalty for the transformer explosion. We've started some Facebook pages for some of these plants that seem to be ending up in the news a lot, and eventually I'd like to do one for every nuke plant in the U.S. So far we have Prairie Island, Diablo Canyon, Vermont Yankee, Hanford Site, North Anna, Brunswick, San Onofre, Byron, Fort Calhoun and Cooper, the flooded plants in Nebraska. And we'll be adding to that list. I think Indian Point for sure needs to be moved to the top of that list. And just in the last few minutes, um, Drew had alerted us in the chat room that there was something going on with the spent fuel pool. At Fukushima, number four, they've had to stop the cooling, and it was just posted on any news. Possible leak at number four spent fuel pool cooling system halted for inspection. Last night, I posted the feed for the JNN camera because it looked like they were welding underneath the spent fuel pool. And now seeing the story about the leak, that's probably what was going on. It's looking for the cause of trouble, suspecting a possible water leak in the system which was halted after the alarm was triggered at 2.44. Utility said the water temperature at that time was 28 degrees Celsius and is expected to rise by about half a degree per hour while the cooling system is under suspension. If you haven't looked at the interactive, how close do you live to a nuke plant yet, I would suggest doing that today. You can find that if you search it on Google, and I think we have a link to it on Fukushima Facts. And when you go to this website, you put in your zip code, and it will tell you all the plants that are located around you. It will show them to you on a map. It will show you the evacuation zone around them. And in general, if you're going to evacuate an area because you suspect that there's been a meltdown or you find out that there's a meltdown, you see any kind of large amount of steam or smoke or or fire, if you hear a lot of first responders going to that area, um, that's an indication, obviously, that there's a big problem. Uh, You want to either head north or south. You don't want to go towards the plant. You don't want to go um, east of the plant because you're still going to be in uh, fallout if you head east. So you always go north or south perpendicular to um, the latitude that the plant would be on. And we had one last clip that addresses the politics of the NRC where Barbara Boxer is addressing JASCO. And it's real short. I think it's like two minutes. Well, late last year in Washington, a bitter dispute among the agency's commissioners broke out in public congressional hearings. Do you believe that employees have experienced anything that would be considered to be hostile or offensive? By the chairman. Yes. 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 
infighting among the NRC's commissioners threatens to keep it from moving quickly on safety reforms after Fukushima. And the American public rightly expects the NRC to redouble its efforts to ensure that our nuclear plants are the safest in the world. But that has not happened. We should be focusing on the work that you have to do, not petty politics and personal ambition. This regulatory agency does not regulate effectively. And until it does, there is no way that the public can have any confidence that plants, whether they're licensed or relicensed, won't have some catastrophic event. No one will benefit from a post-catastrophic event hand-wringing that says, oh, we should have done this and we'll do this better next time. The consequences are unimaginable. Okay, I have the zip code for one of the people in chat here, Virtus, 84115, that's Phoenix, and it looks like you are right downwind from San Onofre, which luckily is shut down, but you are, let's see, Palo Verde, 1, 2, and 3, it's about 509 miles to the north. So you're actually in a good spot for the time being, except for the fallout that's coming from Fukushima. And we have another zip code here, 59101 for road dogging. And let's see, closest plants, Columbia Generating Station is 528 miles to your west. Now they do have a reactor that's running there, it's called columbia but it's on the hanford site and hanford is one of considered one of the uh dirtiest nuclear waste sites in the country and let's see if we got any others here jules have you checked yours out yeah i'm about 100 miles but i am west of it so it's east of me i'm in the fermi evacuation zone (laughs) oh no yeah, just like right on the border of it. And I've got another one here from Freezoo, 59937. And you are northeast of Columbia, quite a bit northeast. So in that aspect, you kind of have to just pay attention to wind direction, but you'd probably be okay. It's 258 miles. You're far outside what they consider the evacuation zone. Kurt, how about yours? Well, I'm a I'm I'm a one three one zero eight, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe that uh, JJ has said that that we're we're not too far from one. I think probably within uh, well, Jules, you're a little bit north of us, so I believe that we're probably you know pretty close in, in proximity to one. You're in the red circle of Nine Mile Point. Yes, I'm in the red. No, that was a joke. <laughs> So, yeah, I'd probably go south of there if anything happened at that plant. So just be aware of your surroundings. Keep an eye on the earthquakes. I'm going to post all the links for the earthquake monitors again. We'll be back next Tuesday and Thursday. Until then, be safe. Thanks, Jules. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Christine.